Part 1 You'll hear a student asking for advice on her accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. So, what can I do for you? Well, it's about the accommodation where I'm staying at the moment. First, can you give me your name and address, please? Yes. I'm Maria Dominguez, and the address is 12 Pine Tree Terrace. It's in Westcliff. I'm staying with two other students. There's actually four of us in the house, us three students and the lady who rents the house to us. So, is there a problem? Well, there are a few, actually. You know, I'm a first-year student, and though I lived away from home for a while when I was studying over the summer in Mexico City, I've never lived abroad, and it's a big change for me. The course is tough, but that's not the main difficulty. I'm coping with that up till now, anyway. The accommodation was arranged for you by our office, wasn't it? It's a nice place by the sea. Okay, but it's difficult. There are only a few buses, and it takes about 50 minutes. It's just so far away, and there's no way I can get back if I want to stay on after 7. And also the other thing is, there's nothing to do there. It's basically just a village. All my friends stay on campus. What about the girls you live with? Do you get on with them? Well, when I see them, but one of them is hardly ever there. Mostly she stays in a house with friends. They've got plenty of extra space, you see. The other girl is quiet as a mouse and hardly ever leaves her room. The landlady's friendly enough, though a bit forgetful, and she doesn't keep the place very clean. I don't have any real problem with her as a person, though. I understand it's rather far away. So I suppose you'd like us to find you a place in the halls of residence or closer by in the town. That would be good. You did say in your brochure that most first-year students are offered a place in halls. I think it actually said final-year students have priority there. They need the library facilities more for studying for their finals. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Anyway, let's see what we can do. Just a moment, I'll check what might be free. Sometimes students drop out or move from halls, though we were full at the beginning of term. By the way, have you checked the student notice boards? You know there's one in each of the four colleges, don't you? There are often requests for people to share houses, and it can be quite cheap. No, I hadn't thought of that, but it's a bit of a risk living with complete strangers. Now, I see there's a room free in Hillside College. That's the one with the tall tower, right? That's it. It's the smallest college and has a reputation for being quite fun. Oh, but it's a shared room. Would you consider that? That's going to be a problem for studying, isn't it? What if she plays music all the time, and maybe we won't have anything in common? Maria, I see you're studying history. So is this girl, Francesca. She's Italian. 
Well, at the moment, I'm doing the general humanities course, which includes history, but actually, I'm planning to change to literature quite soon. That's not the thing, though. I really want a room on my own. Right. I'm afraid I don't see any other openings. There's nothing showing up on the computer, at least on campus. Well, if I have to stay where I am now, I'm going to find it more and more depressing. Here's one more thing we can try. The university owns several places on the Thanet Road and also by the West train station. Both of these are about a 20 minute walk down the hill. They're not the newest of buildings, but I could check for you. Can you come back tomorrow? Oh, no, that's Saturday. What about Monday? Yes, sure. I'd really appreciate it if you could do something for me. Let's hope so. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to a man talking to a group of people at a weekend work conference in a hotel. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. OK, can everyone listen again now, please? Now you know how much of the weekend will be work and what some of the meetings and sessions are about, I'd like to tell you something about how you can spend some of the free time you have over the weekend, both inside the hotel and outside in the town centre. As I've said, you'll be free from around five today and on Saturday and from lunchtime on Sunday and there's plenty to do. This is the first time we've had the conference at the Royal Spa Hotel, and I'm sure you'll agree it's a very nice place. Really, there's no need to leave the hotel at all if you don't want to, but I'm sure some of you will want to get out for a change of environment. OK, first, restaurants and bars. I'm sure you all saw that there was a bar near the entrance as you came into the hotel, but there are actually two more bars. One is also on the ground floor, behind the main restaurant, and the other is on the top floor. That one has a very nice terrace where you can sit outside and enjoy the view. That bar is for hotel guests only and is usually a bit quieter. As I say, the main restaurant is on the ground floor. We will have breakfast and lunch there, so you'll get to know it well. There is also a smaller restaurant for coffee, sandwiches and snacks on the third floor and that is also only for hotel guests. There is a gym and health club in the basement. The gym has a good range of equipment and is open from 7am. I know some of you were talking about a swimming pool but unfortunately there is no swimming pool. I will tell you where there is a pool close to the hotel in a moment. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, I hope to see some of you around the hotel over the weekend, but I'm sure you will want to get out and see the town at some point. If you'd like to look at the map on the screen, I'll show the area around the hotel. There is a map of the town centre in your welcome pack too. OK, a y you can see the hotel here in the middle of the map and the main entrance here at the top in Carlisle Street. OK, a y that swimming pool I promised to tell you about is here in Cromwell Road. If you turn right out of the hotel, it's about 10 minutes up the road in the third street on the left. It's open until 7pm and until 5 on Sunday. There's a very nice park here to the north, again about 10 minutes away. In the middle of the park is a boating lake, so if the weather's good on Sunday, it might be a nice way to relax. If you want to see a movie this evening or on Saturday night, the cinema is here, in the high street. Come out of the hotel and turn left. The high street is only three minutes away. The cinema is here at the top of the street next to a fairly large car park. Now, restaurants. There is a good Chinese restaurant in the middle of the high street, here on the right. It's directly opposite the town hall. It's called the White Orchid. Another very nice restaurant is Leonardo's. It does Spanish and Mexican food. It's here, at the bottom of the high street. So, turn left at the end of Carlisle Street, walk down for five minutes, and you'll see it on the other side of the road. I went to Leonardo's last time I was here, so I can recommend it. Now, if anyone wants to see some live music, there is always a jazz band playing at the Pink Coconut. y e a h That's right, the pink coconut. That's here, in a little street behind the hotel. The street name is not on the map, but it's easy to find. Turn right out of the main entrance, and then take the first right to go back round to the back of the hotel. So, I think that's everything. Please ask me if you have anything else. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a dialogue between two students, David and Jim. First, you have some time to look at questions 22 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 22 to 25. Hi, Jim. Hi, David. I'm glad I found you. I've got a topic for our presentation next month. What is it? I thought it would be a good idea to talk about glass and how it's recycled. That doesn't sound very interesting. That's what I thought, but it is. Did you know that glass has been around since as early as 4000 BC, when glass was used in the Middle East as a glaze to decorate beads? Is it really that old? Yes, and by 1550 BC, coloured glass vessels were widespread and used for cooking and drinking. The earliest known clear glass is a vase found in Nineveh in Assyria, dated from around 800 BC, which is now in the British Museum here in London. You know, I think I've seen that. I was at the British Museum a couple of months ago with Lisa. We don't realise how valuable glass was. It wasn't used widely back then. 
Until the 18th and 19th centuries, glass was very expensive and was used for limited applications, such as stained glass windows for churches. Large-scale glass manufacturing began with the Industrial Revolution, with the mass production of glass containers beginning at the onset of the 20th century, and glass light bulb production automated in 1926. How expensive? I don't know. But nowadays glass is much less expensive and is taken for granted as a packaging material, in addition to its use in windows and other applications. Do you know what glass is made from? New glass is made from a mixture of four main ingredients – sand, soda ash, limestone and other additives. These additives include iron for colour – brown or green, chromium and cobalt for colour – green and blue respectively, lead to alter the refractive index, alumina for durability and boron to improve the thermal options. Annually, total glass use in the UK is estimated at around 3.6 million tonnes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 31. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 31. You're kidding. That's phenomenal. What do we do with all that glass? Where does it go? Using present technology, the UK glass industry has the capacity to recycle over 1 million tonnes of glass each year. And this, coupled with the material's unique ability to be infinitely recycled without compromising its quality, creates a compelling case for the recycling of glass. Despite this, glass makes up around 7% of the average household dustbin, and last year over 2.5 million tonnes of this material was landfill. How can glass be recycled? It can be recycled indefinitely as part of a simple but hugely beneficial process, as its structure does not deteriorate when reprocessed. In the case of bottles and jars, up to 80% of the total mixture can be made from reclaimed scrap glass, called cullet. What's it called? Cullet. C-U-L-L-E-T. Cullet from a factory has a known composition and is recognised as domestic cullet. From bottle banks it is known as foreign and its actual properties will not be known. Recycling two bottles saves enough energy to boil water for five cups of tea. You know, I wouldn't mind a cuppa now. Did you know that recycling reduces the demand for raw materials? There is no shortage of the materials used, but they do have to be quarried from our landscape, so from this point of view, there are environmental advantages to recovering and recycling glass. For every tonne of recycled glass used, 1.2 tonnes of raw materials are preserved. Recycling also reduces the amount of waste glass which needs to be used as landfill. I know. It's a social conscience we all need to have. Taking part in recycling the waste we produce makes us think about the effects we are having on our environment and enables us to contribute towards a greater level of sustainability. It's not all about economics, you know. I'm sure you're right, Jim. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture given by a tour agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Hawaii Tour Agency. Let me tell you a little about a special package we have going on this week. I know everybody wants to get away from the stress of work and life, so I think you should all consider a week-long vacation to the paradise of Hawaii. First off, let me tell you all a little bit about Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are of volcanic origin and are edged with coral reefs. Because of its volcanic origins, people often go especially to see the volcanoes. Hawaii is the largest and geologically the youngest island of the group. Oahu is the most populous and economically important. The capital of Honolulu is located on the island of Oahu, the only U.S. state in the tropics. Hawaii is sometimes called the Paradise of the Pacific because of its spectacular beauty, abundant sunshine, expanses of lush green plants, and beautiful colored flowers, palm trees, coral beaches with rolling white surf, and cloud-covered volcanic peaks rising to majestic heights. Some of the world's largest active and inactive volcanoes are found on Hawaii and Maui. Eruptions of the active volcanoes have provided spectacular displays, but their lava flows have occasionally caused great property damage. The lava can spill down the mountains into the settlements where people live. The most famous of these is right by Honolulu. It is called Diamond Head because from far away, the top of the volcano looks like a diamond. Vegetation is generally luxuriant throughout the islands, with giant fern forests and lush vegetation. Although many species of birds and domestic animals have been introduced on the islands, there are few wild animals other than boars and goats, and there are no snakes. The coastal waters abound with fish. More ethnic and cultural groups are represented in Hawaii than in any other state. Chinese laborers who came to work in the sugar industry were the first of the large groups of immigrants to arrive, starting in 1852, and Filipinos and Koreans were the last, after 1900. Other immigrant groups, including Portuguese, Germans, Japanese, and Puerto Ricans, came in the latter part of the 19th century. Intermarriage with other races has brought a further decrease in the number of pure-blooded Hawaiians who comprise a very small percentage of the population. Now all of this sounds very interesting, right? For only $600 per person, we are offering a tour package to Hawaii. This includes your round-trip airfare and fully guided tours. The duration of the trip is five days, including hotel for five nights and tour buses that will take you all around. We will go to the famous beaches, the volcanoes, and the forests. Sign up today to save your space as seats are running out quickly. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Music